for the audience and the invitation to come here. So yesterday we were very fortunate to visit the Kokora Valley and we saw um, an orchid uh, greenhouse. So my husband took this beautiful picture. I had a very boring title slide before. So, so this case, I'm, the reason I have this interest in food allergy is that lots of patients come to see us. They think because we're gastroenterologists, we know why they have trouble when they eat food or when they have a bad reaction to food. So these, I'm going to talk about adverse reactions to f food. So I'm going to talk about some two cases of food-induced emergency situations. This actually was the colleague of a wife. She was a lawyer who worked at the University of Virginia, and they were neighbors of some friends who were moving to another university, so we had dinner at our house. And this woman, while I was in the kitchen with my husband, started to get wheezing, chest tightness, lightheaded during the first course. We had served a consomme soup of tomato with a slice of avocado and lobster meat. And when I say we, it's really my husband. I'm just the sous chef. Um, and luckily for me, one of the other guests was a pulmonary fellow. She actually was trained in Austria, but she was doing training again in the United States. So she was able to help the lady with uh, inhalers, and she started to feel better. The guest reported that she had known allergy to latex rubber and that she was also allergic to shrimp. The next case is another patient that I heard of that they asked for assistance. He was a 28-year-old waiter. He worked in, the, um, in a restaurant, and he came in very late at night to the emergency room with progressive headache, flushing, wheezing. He was found to be hypotensive, tachycardic. His respiratory rate was 24. He was afebrile. His neurological examination was normal. His skin was normal, no hives, no rashes, and his abdominal exam was unremarkable. He never had an illness like this until that day he presented in the emergency room, and he felt well until he started his work in the evening as a waiter. His only past medical history, I spelled it wrong, was an appendectomy at age 13. So I'm going to come back to these cases later. So two different types of adverse reaction to food. So we categorize adverse reactions to food into two major types. One called food allergy or food hypersensitivity. And this includes different types of immune reactions to food. And it can include an acute hypersensitivity where typically the allergy that people have when they eat a peanut or they eat seafood and they get nausea, vomiting, they can get respiratory symptoms, GI symptoms, or dermatological symptoms. Then there's allergic eosinophilic gastroenteritis, and we now know more about this condition, perhaps because of eosinophilic esophagitis, which is clearly associated with food allergy, but it can also affect the stomach, the small bowel, and even the colon. Then we have these disorders that affect children that are a form of colitis or enterocolitis, and they're sensitive to different types of food proteins, typically cow's milk, but also soy um, and rice and some other proteins that cause this syndrome. And the other one I just talked to you about before the break, celiac disease, which is a T-cell-mediated immune response. Then there's this category that's far more common, which are the non-immune or so-called intolerances of food. And so non-celiac gluten sensitivity would fall in this category. Pseudo-anaphylactic reactions, food poisoning, food toxicity, pharmacological reactions to food, metabolic reactions, lactose intolerance, idiosyncratic reactions, and psychological reactions. I won't talk about all of them because some of them are not so much emergencies. So this is another nice way of looking at the, the division between the two types of the ones in red are the immune reactions and the non-immune are shown in green. And here we have the major types of it, the um, IgE-mediated, which would be the oral allergy syndrome, hives would be examples of it, and the other ones are different types of immune mechanisms. 
The pharmacological food reactions typically do not include gastrointestinal complaints. They typically present to people who look after um, like pulmonary or respirology, people who are skin specialists, or to allergists. So syndromes where there's increased amounts of histamine in very aged cheeses, they're very old cheeses, um, tuna and other scombroid type of fish that have been sitting around, they decompose and they release a lot of histamine. So when somebody eats the flesh of these older fish, they get a very high level of histamine that mimics the symptoms to some extent of anaphylaxis, causing we wheezing, causing flushing, and headache. Doesn't typically cause GI symptoms, the scombroid poisoning. And then there's chemicals we add to our food, to our wine, sulfites, tartrazine, MSG, caffeine, and amines, but they rarely cause gastrointestinal problems. So the immunological reactions to food, I've touched on them, the food hypersensitivity, the celiac disease, and in children, these more complex enteropathies. So in the U.S., 4 to 5 percent of the population actually have food allergy. I don't know what the statistic is in Colombia. The same? Nobody knows? No, we, no idea. Okay. <laughs> All right. And then of the patients who have food allergy, many of them have associated what we call atopic tendencies or allergic tendencies. 30 to 40 percent of them will have a history of asthma or eczema, which is also called atopic dermatitis. These days, in most of the western part of the world, Europe, Australia, Canada, and the U.S., about 50% of the cases of anaphylaxis seen in the emergency departments are now due to food allergy. Food allergy is now more common than anaphylaxis to drugs or to insect stings in most of these countries that I mentioned. Seventy percent of patients with food allergies have a family history of allergy and other atopic diseases, but... 20 to 30 percent of the population think they have food allergy. I'm sure that all of my colleagues here from the U.S. and other parts of the world, and certainly in Colombia, think they have food allergy when they come to see, see you. But most of them have food intolerances, either sp specific or nonspecific. Many patients with IBS or functional GI disorders have food intolerances not due to specific mechanisms, and certainly food allergy would be a relatively rare cause of, of these presentations. So I already said some of this. We know from studies that patients who have functional disorders, either psychiatric, psychological, or gastrointestinal functional GI disorders, have a likelihood of having adverse reactions to drugs and adverse reactions to foods. The actual incidence of food allergy is not calculated accurately in most of the world. Most of the studies of food allergy come from the U.S., from Scandinavia, and some other European countries. So again, the estimate is growing in many of the westernized world, and it's thought to be this due to this thing called the hygiene hypothesis as we change the microbiome, the bacteria and other organisms we have in our GI tract. We're seeing this increase in autoimmune disorders like celiac disease and many other types of autoimmune conditions, but also an increase in allergies worldwide in, in the developed or industrialized nations. We don't know for sure what the mechanism is, but this hygiene hypothesis has been put forward. It's so important in the U.S. now about this threat of food allergy is it made the cover of Newsweek. It has changed our policy on, for example, peanuts. Peanuts are 0.5% of the U.S. population is allergic to peanuts now. And because it's the major food allergen that causes death, it can cause a very nasty reaction. It's common in schools now that children cannot bring peanut butter cookies, peanut, sandwich, peanut butter sandwiches, or things like that to the school because of kids sharing or tasting a bite of another kid and, and having this reaction. So some of the key information we need to know is that the several societies now got together in the U.S. and they defined food allergy as an adverse health effect arising from a specific immune response that occurs reproducibly on exposure to a given food. There are some food allergies that it appears children will outgrow, egg, milk, it used to be thought that peanut you had for life, but now there are studies that show about 20% of children will lose the IgE anti-peanut 
allergen level will go down over time. The big eight in the U.S. are milk, soy, eggs, wheat, peanuts, tree nuts like almonds, walnuts, um, Brazil nuts, things like that, fish and shellfish. It does depend a little bit where you are in the world. For example, in the Middle East, peanut allergy is quite unusual, but sesame seed is a common allergen there because it depends what you get exposed to in your diet. So about 50% on average of individuals with food allergy will have GI symptoms. It can start in the mouth and then it moves down so there's nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. The other major systems that are affected are the skin, the respiratory tract, and if it's severe enough, systemic with anaphylaxis. So the skin reactions you can see in the small picture on the arm, urticarial lesion, the hives, and the lip swelling from oral allergy, respiratory symptoms, and the, we do have GI syndromes, the oral allergy syndrome, and from GI anaphylaxis. So there are some risk factors for people who have risk of anaphylaxis. So any patient who's previously had an anaphylactic reaction to a food or something else should be prepared to have epinephrine, EpiPen. I assume you have those, uh, the same type of thing in Colombia. People who have respiratory symptoms are worrisome and they're predictive that maybe their next attack will be anaphylactic. There are certain allergens, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and seafood are more likely to cause anaphylactics than, let's say, cow's milk or corn or things like that. Uh, thank you. Or taking a beta blocker or an angiotensin converting enzyme also increases the risk. And the reason for that is they dampen, they negate some of the symptoms of anaphylaxis with the sympathetic drive, and so that people don't recognize that somebody is going into anaphylaxis if they take these drugs. So peanut allergy, I already mentioned, is very common in the U.S. It has varying presentations, but it is the number one cause of anaphylaxis in the U.S. and probably in Canada as well, where this, these are nations that eat a lot of peanut butter and peanuts. The dose can be very small. Many patients don't recognize that they have already been exposed to the antigen, and then their first time they eat it, they have anaphylaxis. Seafood is another example. When I was training in Canada, there was a gastroenterologist from Toronto who refused to shake hands with people anymore because once at DDW, Digestive Disease Week, he shook hands with someone who had been eating shrimp and he was allergic to shrimp. And so somewhere during the reception, he licked his fingers and he got anaphylaxis and sustained a heart attack. It's not funny, but it just shows you how severe some of these reactions can, can be. So some people will lose sensitivity to peanut and often these individuals have other allergies beyond peanut as well. The oral allergy syndrome is something I think as gastroenterologists you should be aware of because the mouth belongs to us. It's part of the digestive tract. So some patients and also lots of allergists and dermatologists won't be so familiar with allergy syndromes that affect the mouth. It's a very localized IgE allergy. It does not involve the respiratory tract or the skin. It's typically just in the mouth. Some of them have a form frust. It's not a full-blown thing where they just feel tingling and their lips start to swell, their tongue starts to swell and they don't always know what's going on. But these individuals can end up with problems, especially if it starts to affect their throat, then they feel like they are, can't breathe and then they see it as an emergency. So there are cross reactions between different plants and different um, fruits and vegetables that have cross reacting antigens. So some of these individuals have a separate history of pollen allergy or grass allergy. And he, here again, it's the sensitization that causes high levels of IgE to specific proteins in food. And most of you think of proteins in animal products, but there are some proteins in plants as well that give this rise to it. You can see these different pollen food associations. Birch pollen is very common allergy in, the, in Scandinavia, for example. And this is one of the more common ones I see in my practice when people see me, is that they get apples or pears, this type of fruit gives them these syndromes. So the main thing, as I'll come to later, is educating your patient about potential cross-reacting uh, antigens 
and they just have to avoid these things and as well be prepared to, to take antihistamines or perhaps even epinephrine. So there's a reaction you can see with different families. Ragweed pollen, I don't know if you get ragweed pollen in um, this part of the, the world. Do you know ragweed? I should have taken a picture. It's a very common allergen in North America. In the fall, it's kind of yellow. But So the other one we should all be aware of too because we do endoscopy, although now latex is so scarce, we get non-latex gloves. But one day, one of my nurses told me every time she ate bananas, she's latex allerg allergic, but she told me every time she ate bananas, her tongue would start to tingle. And she, So I told her, go see an allergist, because you'll see from this slide that sensitization to the, the protein in the rubber latex plant that's in latex that we wear is an IgE antibody that can cross-react with similar antigenic epitopes in the protein of different foods. So you can see there's different, there's 10 different proteins in the latex that can overlap with different foods. And the more common ones, they overlap protein five with kiwis. Potato, tomato is, is the um, HEV, it's a scientific name for the rubber plant, seven. And then avocado, chestnut, and banana overlap. So how you evaluate patients for adverse reactions to food, history is so important. You want to make sure they don't have lactose intolerance. You may offer them, if it sounds like it's an allergic type of presentation, to do skin testing or to do IgE blood testing for specific antibodies to specific foods. You want to look at their peripheral eosinophil count, which if they don't have helminthic parasites like strongyloides, then you should be thinking about um, allergic conditions such as eosinophilic esophagitis, which is less common to have high peripheral eosinophils in the blood, but in the eosinophilic gastroenteritis syndromes, at least 50% of them will have elevated blood uh, eosinophils. You may want to look at a workup for celiac disease. I often tell people to go away and write, keep a diary mainly to show them that they have no specific association because they probably have IBS. Hypoallergenic trial as well sometimes can be helpful. And then some of these patients need to go on to an endoscopy and biopsy. And I typically biopsy the esophagus, the stomach, and the duodenum in these patients to look for things like increased eosinophils, celiac disease. The diagnostic tools, what I've shown you here on the, the arm here is prick testing, and these are the positive and negative controls here. And this is histamine that shows the patient is capable of getting an urticarial type of reaction to the histamine. If they take steroids or if they take antihistamines, then they're less likely to have po truly positive responses. And so the allergist will typically put on multiple different types. And these are um, skin prick tests. There are many other unusual ways that food allergy is diagnosed in North America, which is not evidence-based and um, alternate type of practitioners. So sometimes we do a trial of an elimination diet. In some centers that have very um, uh, centers of excellence for allergy, they may do a supervised food challenge to see what symptoms the patients will have. So the key management of food allergy is avoiding food allergens to educate the patient. In the U.S., we were the last major westernized or industrialized country in the world that decided we should start labeling our food for the eight major allergens in 2006. In 2008, we start to label for gluten, but it's still imperfect. imperfect. The other thing is to educate the patient of what symptoms and signs to look for. So patients who start to get tightness in their chest, feel like they're wheezing, need to be instructed to give themselves epinephrine before they advance to a more severe reaction and also go to the emergency room. In the U.S., but you can access this website as well anywhere in the world, is the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Network based out of um, Virginia. It's a, it's a foundation. It's, it's free to access this, the information. It's a very good website for patients who need this one here to actually um, look up information about food allergies. They have information sometimes also about celiac disease, lactose intolerance, other foods, things that aren't necessarily an allergy. 
The treatments can be antihistamines, mast cell inhibitors, but we don't really have any that are commercially available, chromalin, sodium, and corticosteroids. Injectable epinephrine is only a short-term solution because it counteracts some of the properties of histamines, which are intense vasodilators and cause bronchospasm. So epinephrine allows people not to get the full-blown uh, reaction, but they're not good enough for the long term. So these patients need to be rehydrated, typically given corticosteroids, so that they don't have a relapse when the epinephrine starts to wear off. Unfortunately, unlike venom stings from insects, from inhaled allergens, oral desensitization or skin desensitization does not work for patients with food allergies. There have been some studies from Italy suggesting benefit, but this is not recommended yet to help. So back to the cases I told you about at the beginning. So the first woman, who's a friend of a friend at a goodbye dinner party, who developed shortness of breath after eating in our house a soup that was made out of tomatoes and had a slice of avocado and a slice of lobster on top. So the differential diagnosis here, in my mind, was that she either had a food allergy to tomato or lobster, because sometimes there's cross-reactivity. She had a past history of allergy to shrimp, or that she had cross-reaction of avocado with the latex, because she had known latex allergy. So what I recommended, and I never, this was not too long before we left Virginia, I never heard the outcome. I told her, you need to go see an allergist to get assessment with either skin testing or radioabsorbent testing for IgE to likely culprits to find out what caused her reaction. So the second case, can anybody guess what this is? You know the answer probably. So this is not an allergy. Remember the gentleman had flushing, headache, tightness in his chest and felt like he was starting to wheeze. So he was a waiter. So what happened is there was a tuna fish that was not very... It hadn't been cooked. It was a sushi restaurant he worked at. And later that evening, they made some sushi just for the staff, and he ate a lot of this. And so we assumed that he had scombroid poisoning, which is from decomposition of these fish, typically tuna and related types of fish, that decompose. It doesn't taste terrible. What, what's happened is that they have a lot of histamine in the flesh. And histamine is destroyed by cooking, typically, but because he was eating sushi, he was eating a whole lot of food with, with uh, histamine in it. And so usually the treatment for this is you're not going to refer him to an allergist. You have to recognize the clinical scenario that this is not a typical allergic response, but one to an overdose of histamine, which mimics it. It's a pseudo-allergic response in the sense that it mimics some of the same symptoms of mast cell degranulation. So he just knows now not to eat tuna. He probably is put off from eating tuna sushi for some time now. So, so the take-home messages here are patients with adverse reactions to food, maybe not the emergency ones, but the ones that give them GI symptoms. They're going to find you and you and you and me to talk to about why they feel bad. So sometimes it's helpful to have some insight to the different type of food reactions. You nef definitely need to recognize the clinical emergency because all of us can be on an airplane or at a wedding and they call for a doctor and unless you have an ER doctor friend or someone, you may be the one to have to help the patient who's having a food emergency, such as from peanuts or seafood, you have to recognize the airway, breathing, circulation, get them to a proper medical center, and then subsequently that patient and their family need education about what caused the allergy and cross-reacting food. So remember, too, I don't think it's probably true in Colombia yet, but in much of the world, food allergy is the number one cause of death from anaphylaxis. And so therefore, in ideal circumstances, it could be preventable. So, And again, this is a very nice picture from us in the Kokora Valley. Yesterday, um, we did tree planting, so we planted some of the wax palms. So again, thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions.